Okay, everybody, welcome. Thank you so much for having me back here. Um, we are um, reading from the book of the, continuing reading from our book, The Inner Work from Rava Ashlag. And we start off every class, as you know, in Torah Judaism, we start off by dedicating our learning to people who, people who need either souls that need an aliyah or people who need to be to some kind of healing or rescue in their life, and so here are our names. Rufu Shlema for? We have Rufu Shlema for Sarah, Leah, Bat, Vega. And then we have... So, um, okay, these are for... These following names are for that they're on the yard site when the, uh, the, the um, date of the person's passing, we, uh, we pray that their aliyah should continue, that their neshama, their soul, should continue to go closer and closer to God, higher and higher. So we have Harav Menasha Ben Eliezer Zev. We have um, Klein. Menashe Hakatan. He, his name he goes by Menashe Hakatan, which means uh, Menashe the small, which is a very high um, praise of a person that they're very humble. Uh, we have here, uh, what is this? Zuhuto. Zuhuto Yagen Elenu. And then Rav. Okay, Rav Amram Ben Harav Yitzchak Yaakov Bloom. Mm -hmm. And Z okay, Zechuto Yagen Aleinu. And then, Labdi, we've got uh, Bracha Batzlacha for our friends in Holland. Okay, so we have our, one of our students from Holland. We have a, is this for, what is this for? For success and Batzlacha. Okay, for this, uh, a Bracha, a special Bracha for um, success, uh, whatever she's involved with, Rivka Bat Ar Avraham. Avraham. And, also. and then also Shlomo Ben Avram. And also his wife Miriam Bat Avram and my and Yehuda Aryeh Ben Avram. I am also Yehuda Aryeh. So, and we spoke before. So, uh, good luck to you, uh, Yehuda Aryeh, and we wish you the best. And we're so excited that you're joining us from Holland. And hello to everybody who's joining us online. Um, we said last time that you know if you're joining us, it means that. We, we have something in here in Spot that we talk about a lot, which is called Hashkacha Pratis, which means divine, um, what's it, what's the, what is it in English? Divine intervention, divine guidance, divine guidance. So we believe that everything is happening down to the blade of grass growing is all being orchestrated from above. And so if you are joining us, if you're watching a clip either on YouTube or on Zoom or any other, other platform, know that you are uh, here for a purpose. Okay, so L'chaim L'chaim everybody. I want to start off, I want to go back to something that happened in our last class. We had a student here, and he asked a very important uh, uh, question for Kabbalah. He said that when we're interacting with God, are we interacting, are we pretending, and are, does God not need anything from us, and therefore we're just kind of going through the motions, we're playing a game, we're as if. So I'm angry, or I'm upset, or I'm confused, and I'm talking to God. But it's not really happening, but it's an as-if thing. We're imagining it, we're creating it. And this is something that philosophically is something that a lot of people believe and that this is something that came out of the post-modern thinking that we are, we are creating God, that God doesn't actually exist. Sorry, just gonna push record here again on one of the cameras. That God doesn't really exist, or if he exists, he's outside of our somehow, uh, um, sphere of influence that we can't actually get to God so either there's we need a God but we don't really have one and we're making it up because we've decided in secular humanism we've decided that it would be a good thing for us to have a God so that we can all do th nice things like like each other and not misbehave and then the second there are other thinkers this is I think Einstein if I'm not misquoting him thought like this that there, there is a God but he is somehow outside of our ability to connect with him and that he set something up and it's happening uh, biologically, it's happening uh, al p according to evolution and we get what we get. And this is exactly the opposite of what we are saying here uh, in Ashla Kabbalah and in all the Torah. The, the Hashem is reachable and we connect with him in a real true sense through Torah and mitzvot. And as we get closer and closer to uh, Mashiach consciousness to the time where we have, where we exit our egos and we enter into spirituality, we will see that it's more real than anything we've ever, we've ever experienced. So the conversations that we will have when we are in an altruistic space will be irrefutably true and real and won't be, won't be worth 
saying to anybody. It will be so self-evident to every person within their sixth sense. It would be like saying, is this a table? There's no table. And that's true that there might not be actually a table, but let's not get into the quantum physics of reality. And that's a whole other Kabbalistic conversation about how really everything is being projected outward from, our, from inside of our consciousness. But when it comes to God, God is the true real thing. And we are the ones that are, um, we are uh, lucky to be, to feel that, we're, that we exist. But when we get to Mashiach consciousness, we will see that God is not only real and not only orchestrating every last thing that's happening, but he's also fully, fully involved in all of our emotional, that's what the spheros are, the lower seven spherot, zera anpin, are the emotional aspects. And God created those things. So if we're frustrated, God not only knows what it means to be frustrated, but God created frustration. So we said all this last time, that was, a, that was a review, but I wanted to add one more very, very important Kabbalistic uh, construct to this, uh, to this um, map that we're building. So, Kabbalah is the study, the attainment, meaning that we are going to experience this within ourselves, of the light that came off of God. So God himself in his essence, had an idea that he wanted to give over goodness to someone, and we are those somebodies that God wanted, all of creation are the somebodies that God wanted to give over goodness to. So, the study of Kabbalah, the entire tree of life, all the way from Keter, all the way down to Malchus of Malchus, which is our world, is the light that came off of God. God sent it out to us. Okay, that was the, that was the gift that God, God gave us. Now, according to Kabbalah, God himself, in his essence, is unknowable. Is unknowable. That we do not have an idea about what God is. It's so beyond any of our um, kalim, of our vessels, of either faith vessels or intellectual vessels or emotional vessels, that we do not have any idea at all about what is above the, what we can scientifically, Kabbalah is a science. It is a science of our internal worlds and it can only, the only laboratory is within us. And ultimately, when everybody has the same laboratory within them, when they come online, we will all be communicating with each other and we'll see that it's a true science and it's as much a science as quantum physics and as physics and biology and all the other Sciences. So we have to understand that this is a very scientific methodology that we are talking about. And Ashlag has explained it since he's a modern person only 100 years ago, 70 years ago. Explained it in very modern terminal terminology. So now that I said that, which is a huge thing to just, we could think about that for six months, but we have to add another layer, okay? And so the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the, um, the, the seventh of the, seven Chabad rabbis from the first rabbi, the Alter Rebbe, all the way through to the Lubavitch Rebbe, wrote and created, they elaborated, they codified, they wrote down Hasidut. They had the, we have the Baal Shem Tov, the Baal Shem Tov did not do any writings, some of his students did writings. Came the Alter Rebbe, who was called the Litvak, meaning called the, the European, and the reason why he was called that is because he went and studied by the, uh, the the European uh, Jewish academies where they were extremely methodical and extremely careful about how they learned. They codified everything and they're very organized in their methodology. And so he studied there, so he was known amongst the Hasidim as the Litvak. And he, the, the Alter Rebbe, came and codified and organized the Hasidus of the Baal Shem Tov and organized it all the way through seven rabbis through the generations until we get to this generation. So Lubavitch Rebbe says, that, that uh, Hasidut is higher than Kabbalah. So, when I first started my, my, my journey, my spiritual journey, I was very excited by Kabbalah, and I still am, I was a student of Kabbalah, but when I heard this sentence from the Lubavitch Rebbe, I was so intrigued, and I said, I have to understand what that means, because to me, to everybody, we think 
There's, Hasidut is a kind of watered down Kabbalah that's easier, easy to accept, easy to uh, understand from our vantage point, and that's the whole reason why the, the Baal Shem Tov came in order to make Kabbalah, which is too hard for us, accessible in our low, limited state. Comes the Lubavitch Rebbe and says, no. Chabad Hasidus is even higher than Kabbalah. So, what did I think now? Again, I've had conversations with people who are studying both Hasid, Chabad Hasidut and Ashla Kabbalah, and I believe that what I'm saying is true, but when we find the actual, this in writing, we, I will run to everybody and give them the source of this, but I believe this to, to be what, in part, the Lubavitch Rebbe is trying to communicate. In Kabbalah, we are only studying the light, the spheros, the, the consciousness that is, in, that is wrapped in each of these levels. But we're not studying God himself. We're not accessing God himself in his, in his, um, in his pre-creation state. We don't have any access to that. Comes the Lubavitch Rebbe and says, Chabad Hasidus, by learning Chabad Hasidus, and I probably imagine it's true of, of Breslov Hasidus as well, that we can access God himself. The Alter Rebbe famously said, to, when he was praying, he said out loud, I don't want all, your Olam Haba, Tashem. He was praying, he said, I don't want all the light that's coming off of you, all the gifts, I want you yourself speaking to God. So that is, we've, we haven't had this class yet, but that was in a very abridged version of why the, when you study Chabad Hasidus, you are bringing down the light even further into the Malchus of Malchus, into the darkest place, meaning into the Galut. And in that place, in that darkest of darkest places, we can access God himself. So when I pray to God, I don't say, oh God of the Sphira of Keter or the Sphira of Chach, we don't do this. And I say God. So when a baby, when a, when a 12 year old kid gets in trouble in school, they don't cry out to the light of Hashem. They cry out to Hashem himself. So the irony is that in our limited, dark place, in the Galut, in the exile, we actually have access to God himself. And Chabad Hasidus is, by learning Chabad Hasidus and following the directives of the Rebbe, we can actually access an even higher light than is being discussed in Kabbalah. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? I disagree. You disagree? Yeah. I don't want to discuss it. So you're ha tell me how you disagree, no, and this is an ongoing conversation. I don't want to discuss it. So. I just telling you I disagree. I am, so one of the students is saying they disagree. So I am saying that I am holding in my limited place, and I would like to continue learning this, and we can, we can ask some bigger rabbis and try to find out if what I'm saying is accurate or if I misunderstood that, and I'd love to continue the conversation with you, and hopefully our class is gonna grow and we're gonna get so deep into this that we can have this conversation in depth and look into the actual books and speak to people and see if we can, if we can understand this more. Okay, and I stand, if I'm making any mistakes, which I'm sure that along the way I will, and what I'm saying, I ask everybody's forgiveness, and I also um, will continue. people believe what you said, and a lot of people don't. Okay, so I'd like, let, if you want to share, you can share, and we can uh, talk about it. Okay, so good, very good. So somebody, a student here is saying that some uh, rabbinical authorities agree with the way that I'm saying it, and others do not agree, and so this is a very important conversation that we will continue throughout our learning, okay? Moving on. Any other questions? No? Okay. Is it making sense, the conversation? Okay, good. So moving on. So, before going on to the next excerpt, I want to uh, address the audience. So we are online, and we here in Sfat at the al Sheikh Academy have a mission statement. We are trying, what we believe is that Sfat is a very holy place and a very spiritual place, and we believe that the people who have come to Sfat um, have a special mission to bring the Torah of the, of the Geula, of the redemption, to the world in our way. We have other people, obviously, uh, rabbis across the world, big, huge rabbis in different communities who are doing the exact same thing, but here in Sfat we feel that we have a, I just realized I don't have my glasses on, okay, thank you. Um, so here in Sfat we, we, have a, we feel openly that we are here for, and we have a mission to share this, and through the magic of the internet, we have an ability to reach uh, millions and millions of people and perhaps even more straight here from Sfat. So, I want to just talk a little bit about Jordan Peterson. So Jordan Peterson is a brilliant intellectual 
uh, and I won't go into his history, but he's becoming so popular that the average person knows who I'm talking about. Jordan Peterson is a professor, and he has been doing unbelievable work online. And I'll tell you a quick story. I heard this from Jordan Peterson when I was watching one of his classes, and I, I hope I say it over correctly, that Jordan Peterson was describing a beautiful thing that happened to him. He was walking, I believe, in Brooklyn, but I don't know if it was some other city in the United States, or maybe it was in Canada, and two religious Jews came over to him and said, we call you Rabbi. We call you Rabbi Peterson. So Jordan Peterson has been doing an amazing job of fighting against um, rallying against postmodernism, fascism, and uh, social collapse, and he described himself as a Christian. And I want to address, since we're having this conversation, I want to address, I want to respond to uh, Jordan Peterson. So Jordan Peterson was asked if God exists. And Jordan Peterson said, and Jordan, if you're listening to, I hope that we end up having more conversations and that we uh, can, can, as the Alshak Academy grows, that we can some, make a contact with you and we can uh, have an ongoing conversation and learn. So I, I would like to extend this Kabbalah class to you. And if there's a way for us, for you to respond to what we're saying here, please uh, have somebody reach out to us and we would uh, be very honored to continue the conversation. So if somebody asked Jordan Peterson at a very big lecture, do you believe in God? And Jordan Peterson described himself as a Christian, and he said, I act as if I believe in God. Okay, so I will say to Jordan Peterson that I understand why you said that. I'm not sure you actually believe that, but I want to just say that according to the Torah, that is not what we believe. We believe that God completely exists, and that to me it sounds a little bit like postmodernism that we've created God because we need him and we're not sure he's there, but I want to say to you that the Torah has been given to the Jewish people to bring this wisdom to the world and here we are approaching the messianic times and when uh, to all the scientists who are speaking, there's Eric Weinstein and there's Lex Friedman, all these brilliant intellectuals having beautiful conversations online and uh, I will say to them that we are going to enter into a place where scientifically and uh, in a revealed way, we will know every person that God does exist fully and he is the true existence and we are the ones who have to worry about how much we actually exist. It's a gift from God that we feel that we exist, but God is recreating us at every moment and we, have, we, we are going to have, and we have, there's been people in every generation who have pierced the veil of the spiritual worlds and have entered into a space, the altruistic space, where they have revelations. This is an attainment. This is not something that has to be uh, imagined or uh, that is only accessible through faith. We are going to have many conversations about what true Amuna means and um, that you, the highest level is Amuna. We're going to actually read an excerpt, an excerpt here this today if we get far enough along about what true Amuna is, but I will say to you that, um, that God is not something that man has to imagine and pretend that God exists. God does exist, and we have a way, a method called Kabbalah, which is the inner aspect of Torah, for revealing that by exiting our egos and entering, entering into the altruistic, altruistic space. Okay. Thank you against that message. He is going to get the message because we are on the same platform, YouTube, and I have a deep feeling that um, we will have, and you know, we have Jordan Peterson, Brett Weinstein, Eric Weinstein, Lex Friedman, who are all about as smart as you can get. They're brilliant, brilliant, brilliant people doing amazing things with unbelievable insights. And so if we here at the Al Sheikh Academy are not up to the job, to the task of teaching you Torah and mitzvot and Kabbalah, we will get our teachers, and we will, uh, we will introduce you to the masters, the master Kabbalists of the Jewish people living here in Israel. And if you are ready and willing to learn with us, we will uh, introduce you to the greatest master Kabbalists, and they will tell you about quantum physics and about biology. And these are very important, big conversations, and you can... Um, Decide for yourself if what is being said in the Zohar and by the Ari HaKodesh is making any sense to your brilliant scientific minds. Okay, moving on. The wisdom of Kabbalah deals with our coming to experience the reality of God. The reality of God will be experienced by all of humanity 
as all the peoples of the world are here, not by chance, but to come to union with God. This is a beautiful expert, excerpt we did in the last class, but it's good that I read it anyway here, so it's a perfect place to start off. The Torah is for the entire world. It's true that the Jewish people were, have been given a special mission to safeguard and bring this wisdom to the world, the, the wisdom that will unify the world in love and peace and balance above our egoistic natures and make everything that's happening in society uh, finally work. But the Torah is for the entire world, and that's what the Baal Salom just said here. And this is, a, again, every one of these excerpts, excerpts is a very big conversation how and, and, and how these things are accomplished, but we'll move on for now, okay? Next paragraph. We are to reach a state of always thinking about the good qualities of others. We want to consider other people more important than ourselves. To reach this state of consciousness requires inner work. This is the true essence of Torah and mitzvot. Okay, as with everything that's said in by Rav Ashlag, Rav Yehuda Halevi Ashlag, the great master Kabbalist of our generation, this could sound very simple. Did I read it once or twice? Let me read it one more time. We are to reach a state of always thinking about the good qualities of others. We want to consider other people more important than ourselves. To reach this state of consciousness requires inner work. This is the true essence of Torah and mitzvot. Okay, so we have Alex Friedman uh, from Russia. He's, I believe he lives in the United States, a brilliant, brilliant programmer. And he's always having these deep conversations about programming and about AI. So here, although it sounds very simple, is a mathematically constructed uh, equation, okay? So when we build a neural net, when we build an altruistic neural net, when we get together with 10 people who we study uh, Torah with, and we study Kabbalah with, and we uh, organize our community in the proper way, in order to create this neural net, each of the 10 people have to only be thinking about the other nine. And when this happens, we create a synapse. I'm not, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not gonna use any fancy words. We create a connection between the 10 of us. And so we have 10 people. I'm thinking about the nine of you. You're thinking about the, the nine people outside of yourself. And when one person thinks about themselves, the electricity comes out of the, out of the circuit. Okay? So. It breaks the circuit, correct. So when we want to have this, this vessel of, recep of, of reception, it's reception of God's light, of God's of spiritual energy, of spiritual information. When we want to turn on this switch, the way we're doing it is by exiting the ego. Our e ego exists. We, the ego is the horse that the rider is on, and that does not go away, and that has its own built-in necessities for having that, but let's not, have, let's not complicate the conversation. So when we each think about each other, that's when this screen goes on in our sixth sense, and we can, we can perceive the light of, that we are worthy of receiving at our level. So if the 10 of us are at, let's say, some level along in this tree of life, on some madrega, some level, some rung of the ladder, and we have all earned that rung, the 10 of us, all of us entered into that state, then we, that's how we start to have this, to awaken the sixth sense. It's not by meditating, it's not by laying you know, crystals, and it's not possible if a person is, wants to be a really selfish individual, it's not possible to, ex, to enter spirituality. That is itself a very complicated conversation that I think we should leave for next time because there is, even in spirituality, there is the side of Kedusha and the side of Tuma, and this is a much further along conversation about people who are not good, who seem to be accessing spiritual energies, okay? But this is something way, way beyond the conversation that we're gonna have today, okay. Next, divine revelation needs to be drawn forth in each generation in a way that is fitting for the generation. Divine revelation needs to be drawn forth in each generation in a way that is fitting for the generation. Okay, so last class we spoke about the Baal Sulam said that we have to go from A to B to C to D, that there's a linear progression, this is a ladder. So we go state by state. 
And so here we're seeing that we're building a layer cake throughout of throughout history. And so it says in the Gemara that the earlier generations are greater than the later generations, and yet the later generations stand on the shoulders of the earlier generations. So can you imagine that somebody carried you up a mountain and he's, without him, he fed you the whole time and he carried you up the mountain and he understood all the mechanics of everything that you needed to get up the mountain. He understood about the oxygen, he understood about the food, he understood about the ropes. And yet, when you get up there, he puts you on his shoulders and you can see further than he can. So, the reason why this works is because the early generations are so great that they want you to do better than them. The sages of the Gemara are happy that you're going to do better than us. And ultimately, when we get, to the, we get to the end of this game, we're all going to be included collectively in, without these levels that we're always so busy with. The levels we're busy with because we don't have the unity. Once you have unity, you don't care about the, uh, the levels as much. You don't care, oh, this person's... Uh, if you're having your best life, you don't care that I'm a little bit faster than you, and the other guy's a little bit smarter than you, the other guy... We're all together in this, and the... the, the, the collective, the sum of all the parts is so much greater. In other words, I don't wake up in the morning and say, you know, my liver is, 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 more, is not so happy and my heart is more happy and my left arm is more happy than my right arm. We don't think that way because we're thinking about me. The collective is so many, many magnitudes greater than the parts that the brain cares about all of the pieces, but your arm doesn't wake up and say, I don't want to go to the baseball game. So this kind of, you know, little, this kind of like tit for tat, Arguing is something that we experience because we are in a fetal stage. But when, we, when we're born into spirituality, this will become something that is barely worth discussing. Okay, so moving on. Any questions? The progression of the spiritual worlds is like a ladder with many rungs. The many rungs make spiritual ascension easier. If there were fewer rungs, it would be harder to ascend. I'll read it one more time. It's very clear and understandable. The progression of the spiritual world is like a ladder with many rungs. The many rungs make spiritual ascension easier. If there were fewer rungs, it would be harder to ascend. Beautiful. We all understand. Next. Any questions? Comments? Okay. When we are receiving... Shlomo, I wish I could see your eyes. I can't see your... I can't see... Okay. When we are receiving, we are limited. As, as satiation extinguishes pleasure. When we are giving, we are without limit. Giving is eternal and unlimited. When we are receiving, we are limited. As satiation extinguishes pleasure. When we are giving, we are without limitation. Giving is, ex is eternal and unlimited. Okay, so this is very clear, but let's go into it a little bit. So. We know that when we, we craving cake, we eat one piece of cake, it's amazing. The second piece of cake is still good. And then after that, we're in a horrible position where we can't stop and we're, making, we're, we're miserable, but yet somehow we're stuck in this loop, okay? So we said, it's famously said, I'm not sure who said it, maybe it's the Ariya Kodesh, that when the Messiah comes, when Mashiach comes, when we enter into this higher state of consciousness, the pig will be kosher. So why do we say this? Because the pig is the, uh, is the expression of gluttony. And so we know in physicality, if you are gonna have a piece of birthday cake, it's much better if you have one piece of cake. And if you have three or four or five or six or the whole cake, it's very unattractive and it's not good for anybody. So that is only in physicality, but in spirituality, since we're in an altruistic state, and since we've entered into caring about other people, our desires are going to be altruistic desires. So I'm going to wake up in the morning, I'm going to say, does everybody at the al Academy have somewhere to, to go for the holidays? And I'm going to be busy running around and I'm not going to be uh, satiated until I get through every single person, make sure every single person has a place to eat for the holidays, okay? So that can, goes on forever and ever and ever. If you want to go get, wake up in the morning and you have the deepest desire to just make sure that everybody has this or that, Go for it. Go, don't stop ever, 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 and keep going and going and building and building and getting all the pleasure from that you want. That's what's coming, and that's why, and we're going to still have physicality, and so when, that's why we say there's an inverse relationship between physicality and spirituality, and in, in physicality, we want to moderate. In order to get the best out of life, 
you want to have you want to moderate your desires you want to be say I'm gonna wait another two days to have cake because I know I'm gonna really really enjoy it so I'm moderating it. I'm balancing it an athlete says I want to have 3,000 calories I don't want 4,000 calories because 3,000 calories is my sweet spot where I'm going to achieve all of my goals my higher goals my spiritual goals and my physical goals health whatever the other things maybe you want to you're dating and you want to look your best and so you're therefore you're moderating your your calorie intake this is the way the, the physical world uh, works and in spirituality since we are in altruism we are in an unlimited state of pleasure moving on when we experience God through understanding the experience is limited when we experience God in a state of emuna, which is faith in English transcending understanding then the experience is absolutely limitless again when we experience God through understanding, the experience is limited. When we experience God in a state of amuna, transcending understanding, then the experience is absolutely limitless. Okay? We've had this conversation and we're going to have it over and over and over again until all of us can actually believe it and understand it, internalize it, and live in it. Okay? So, um, People don't like when you tell them it's not scientific, that's just faith. You believe in this thing, I believe in that thing, we're all just making it up ourselves. Somebody, you know, 20 generations made something up and now we're all following this thing, but we're making it up and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an act of faith. Okay, this is not faith according to the Torah. In Torah we have faith below reason and faith above reason. When we believe something that is not true, so if I believe my construct of God is I put it together, but it's not the complete picture, then I'm making something up, and then I'm believing in the thing that I made up. So I um, famously told a story about an atheist came to this rab this great rabbi, um, I'll remember his name, I hope, and he said, he was telling him how silly it is to believe in God, and that faith is a bunch of nonsense, and that it's making trouble for the whole world, that everybody's believing all these silly things, and the rabbi said, I assure you that the God that you don't believe in, I also don't believe in that God. So. According to Torah Judaism, since we are connecting the finite to the infinite, we have a layer of faith. So if I am, let's say you are a ma the, the greatest mountain climber that ever existed, I don't know everything that you know, but I'm following you because I can tell that you are the greatest mountain climber. I've seen your pictures in the newspaper, I've experienced you going up mountains, and I've seen that you're better than everybody else, and I completely put my, when I go on a mountain, I want you there, and I only listen to you. If you tell me to jump, I jump. If you tell me not to jump, I don't jump. I have faith in you, but I have faith above reason. I didn't just pick some clown out of the lineup because he has a, a climber's jacket on. I learned about climbing, and I learned about you, and I found out that you are the best climber, and now I have faith above reason, meaning that if I go up on the thing and you tell me, don't drink, and I say, I'm so thirsty, and you say, don't drink, I'm going to not drink because you know more than I know. So we have a relationship with God who's infinite, and it's a ne never-ending, uh, continual, wondrous, pleasurable experience of experiencing God on a higher and a higher and a higher level, and therefore, there's no way for us in our limited place to connect to God. So to all the scientists, since we started talking about Jordan Peterson and all the other scientists, the amazing, beautiful, wonderful scientists that are doing so much amazing work online and they talk many times about God and many times about the nature of reality and many of the things they're saying are in line with Torah, Torah Judaism. So to those people I say to you that scientifically speaking, you cannot experience God without faith. It is not something to be embarrassed about. It is not something to take out of the equation. You can spend your entire life in your intellect and in your scientific experiment and weighing things and balancing things. And so I invite you to look to, to the right laboratory, the laboratory for you to look to find this missing ingredient to make sense of everything is inside of yourself. And there is a, a, in, in, a, in a mechanical need for faith the way we are describing it in Torah and Mitzvos, in the, in, in the Torah, that if you take that piece out of your scientific methodology, you are going to be in a very lost place. And so I invite you to look inside of yourselves and to find a true connection to God and to study uh, and to connect yourself to the, uh, to the uh, Jewish nation and to the Torah and to understand 
that faith is not something to be embarrassed about if you have faith above reason. If you have faith below reason and you believe that Elvis Presley is God, then yes, it's a very embarrassing thing. Moving on. The Bala Sulam explains on the Torah's language of loving others and use the expression giving to others. He, his intention is that love needs to be expressed through action. The Baal HaSulam expanded on the Torah's language of loving others and used to the expression giving to others. His intention is that love needs to be expressed through actions. Okay. I read this this morning for the first time. And maybe I heard it before when I was studying Sulam, but this is the first time that I heard this and I was blown away because I did not know that the Baal HaSulam said this, but I did know that the Lubavitcher Rebbe made this one of his main tenets, saying that the Iker mitzvah, the main mitzvah, is in the physical action. And Chabad Hasidus comes and says, you're getting all into Kabbalah, and you're getting all into spirituality, and this is exa very exactly what we should do, but please do not forget that the main place, the main place, the main place for you to express your spirituality is in phys physicality. If you sit home and you think about how you want everybody to be fantastic, and we have, I'm not an expert on other uh, modalities and other religions, but it seems to me that there are other religions where you sit and you think about, and you, ex you experience love in your heart, and you sit there for 20 years, Torah Judaism comes, here's the Baal Sulem saying it, it, said, it says it in the Gemara, and Labavatari made it one of his main um, uh, um, points that he wanted to express to our generation, that if you want to be spiritual, get up and go and make sure that somebody next to you has their rent paid and make sure that somebody gets a compliment when they come in with their nice clothes on and make sure that you say hello to people when they and make sure you invite people over to your house who maybe don't have so many friends to come over and that is where your spirituality should be expressed and then everything else internally is built on that place don't forget about we have all these people who experience spiritual sensations surfing and yoga, and I'm not an expert on yoga, I'm not saying anything bad about yoga, I don't know enough, but I'm saying that your love is uh, only complete when it is expressed to somebody else. Okay, through action. Next, next sentence, next paragraph. It is through belief that we fix ourselves. To the extent that we believe in God's goodness, we also become good. Okay, one more time. It is through belief that we fix ourselves. To the extent that we believe in God's goodness, we also become good. Okay, also a very common conversation in the scientific community, in the philosophical community, that um, we say in Torah Judaism that um, the spiritual world is a mirror. So if you're happy, then you're gonna feel back happiness. And if you're sad, you're gonna feel back sadness. And if you are angry, you might feel some anger coming back in your direction. So we are in fact creating our world. But we have to understand that first, God created the scaffolding in which we're living, the program. And in that program, God made it so that we can be the creators. When we, the level of Adam, the highest level of consciousness, when everything is unified, is called Adam, and that is the speaking the speaking level it's called, and why is it called the speaking level? It's called the speaking level because God created the word, the world through speech. God created the world through action. So God is so fully safe and complete and unified and, 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 and in uh, control of everything that he wants you also to be a creator. God wants you to create the reality. And so yes, it's true that we are creating the reality, but it didn't start with us. We are creating a reality within God's reality. So God created the video game and we are playing the video game and in the video game we get to be creators. So what it's saying here is, it is through belief that we fix ourselves. To the extent that we believe in good, God's goodness, we also become good. So if you walk around all day and say God doesn't exist, you are creating in a world in your consciousness where God doesn't exist. If you come and say God exists but he's not involved, then you're creating a world where God is 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 exists but he's not involved in your life if you create a world if you walk around believing that god is not only does he exist and not only is he good but he's completely involved and not only that but he's going to he cares about what i'm saying to him and he's and there is a way for us to unify transcend our egos 
and, and actually have communication with divinity, if you believe that, then that is right here, the Baal Shulam is telling you, that is how you, you enter into the state. If you don't believe it, and you don't act as if you believe it, and you don't actually uh, create a space where that is something, that there is a, for that revelation to occur, it's called Kalim in Kabbalah, the vessels. If you don't create the vessels for this, um, then you're probably not gonna have these um, discoveries inside of yourself. Now, here comes the big question that everybody says, because I've been spending many years in a Chabad house and people come in off the street and they haven't heard anything about Torah and mitzvos, and they come in and they say, well, you're gonna convince yourself, you're gonna convince yourself that this is true, and so you're going to live in a delusion. If you walk around all day and you say something, if you say, you know, um, Elvis Presley is God, then you're going to walk around, and then maybe at some point you can actually believe it. And so you are the one who's creating your own reality. So here we say, this is why in Torah, uh, Torah Judaism, we say, get yourself a real rabbi. Get yourself a, a, a connect yourself to a community that is uh, connected to a lineage of generational rabbis who are uh, who are who are in spirituality, who have attained five souls, and who are uh, right, truly righteous, and steeped in Torah. So I am a chassid of Lubavitch Rebbe, and his father-in-law was a Lubavitch Rebbe, and his father, the, the the previous Rebbe's father was, and they have they have, and then you have each of them have volumes and volumes of books, and you study and you learn and you attach yourself to a community and you don't get yourself lost in some deception. But um, I will say this, that um, the Baba Trebi says there's many, many, many ways to be wrong and there's only one way to be right. So yes, there's many, many pitfalls and the um, Rav Nachman of Breslov says, um, one of our greatest, greatest uh, Kabbalists says that life is a narrow bridge. And so yes, if you walk, if you fall off, if you veer off to the left, you will fall off on the left, and if you veer to the right, you will fall off on the right. And that's why now, to say to the whole world, if you know any Orthodox Jews who are very busy with all of these rules and all these regulations, and they're constantly looking at their watches, and they're very careful about what food goes in their mouth, and they're very careful about what comes out of their mouth, and they're very careful about what goes in their ears, and they're very careful about the way they dress, and all these things, it's because of what we're talking about here, that yes, you have to be very careful and put yourself with true, righteous people who truly, who, who have attained spirituality and are able to help you. So if you want to go to mountain climbing class, don't go to a class where the guy is only trained on a wall at the gym. Go to a guy who's gone up Everest 30 times and knows exactly what he's talking about and has experienced it. And that is uh, very, very true. Moving on. This is a long paragraph. I'll try to read it nicely. The sages say in the Midrash, the Midrash is um, the allegorical level of Torah. It's an um, explanation of the, of the Torah. And so in Judaism, we have five, five ways of describing what's going on in the Bible. And that's one of the confusions in the world is that there's a lot of people who read only the Bible and then they read versions of the Bible that have been changed. But there's a Midrashic level, which is an allegorical level, which is alluding to spiritual things. Three days before the coming of the Mashiach, Eliyahu the prophet will go up to the top of a mountain and blow the shofar to announce the coming of the redemption. People imagine Eliyahu the prophet standing in the forest on the mountain top blowing the shofar. The Bala Sulam explains, however, that the coming of Eliyahu means simply the revelation of the secrets of the Torah, the Kabbalah, to the masses. This is what heralds the redemption. The Kabbalah becoming known in the world is called in coded language, the sound of the shofar. Three days hints that the revelation is drawn down from the highest level of the upper three spheros. I'm gonna read it again. The sages say in the Midrash, three days before the coming of the Messiah, Eliyahu the prophet, Elijah the prophet, will go up to the top of a mountain and blow the shofar to announce the coming of the redemption. People imagine Eliyahu the prophet standing in the forest on a mountain top blowing the shofar. The Balasul explains, however, that the coming of Eliyahu means simply the revelation of the secrets of the Torah, the Kabbalah, to the masses. This is what heralds in the redemption. The Kabbalah becoming known in the world is called, in coded language, the sound of the shofar. Three days hints to the revelation that the revelation is drawn down from the highest levels of the upper three spheros. Okay. 
So we're going to leave the Kabbalah at the end about the three highest spheros because that is not something that we, will be, we were discussing it already in other uh, paragraphs, and this paragraph is very dense, so let's um, deal with the first part of this paragraph. So, the, we said that in the Zohar we're talking about spirituality. We're not talking about physicality, okay? So we have an issue where people become, they materialize everything. This is why the Ari HaKodesh did not want to teach. One of the reasons why the Ari HaKodesh and many of the Kabbalists in the earlier generations did not want to teach Kabbalah because people say, I'm going, I'm, I'm, I entered into this spiritual realm and they say, oh, you went somewhere, you went up to planet, the, to Venus, and there is where you experience these things in a physical space. And that is a tremendous, um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of a word, but it's not, a, it's not, what, is, it's not what the Torah believes. We have, we have something called avodah zarah, which is idol worship. And anytime we concretize in physicality something that is, we're talking about in spirituality, then we are getting ourselves in a, in a, into a bad place. Now, this opens up a massive conversation, okay? There are people who are not Shomer Torah and Mitzvos. They don't do the physical Torah and Mitzvos. And they say, the Baal Sulam said that it's not a man with a shofar. There's no Messiah. It's just a level of consciousness. It's just that this, people are going to learn this, and there's no person called Elijah. Now, this is, I wish I had a picture of the Baal Sulam. Because the Baal Sulam was a rabbi, I'm not sure, at a very young age, he was one of the, they realized that he was one of the greatest rabbis around. And at a very young age, I think they made him the, the chief rabbi of Warsaw or some great, he was a very, very big rabbi. And so I would like to show, if anybody's online, please Google the Baal Sulam. The Baal Sulam is a ultra-Orthodox Jew with big peyot and a big yarmulke and black clothing, and he is as religious as they come. He was, first he became a rabbi of halacha, of the revealed Torah, and he was expert upon expert upon expert at that, so much so that if he opened, he said anything, they made him the rabbi, because he was such a big rabbi, and he knew the, the halacha so well. So this is, he does not mean that there is no blowing the shofar, that there's no actual shofar, and there is no actual Mashiach, there's no person named Mashiach. So I will say this to people who are listening online. If you cut yourself off from the person who is the Mashiach, then you will get the information, but you won't get the interaction with the person who is the Mashiach. So I don't, I don't think about Einstein and what he ate for lunch and where he lived. I don't care, but I know his, some of his theories, right? So I'm connected to his teachings, but I'm not connected to him himself. And so... The Jewish people are the conveyors of this wisdom throughout the generations, and we are connected to the manifestations of these spiritual um, degrees in physicality. So we said that the Iker, the main mitzvah, is in physicality. So yes, it is true that if you think that a man is going to blow a horn, and this horn is going to be the sound that goes into your ear, and that is what is you're going to experience, no, you're going to experience the information, the wisdom, the knowledge of how to live and how to do this, how to access spirituality. And if you are lucky enough, if you're a righteous Gentile or you are a Jewish person and you believe and you are come to Israel, you will meet the actual person who is the Mashiach and he is the physical manifestation of these spiritual things. But this discernment is, takes a few steps, right? First, you have to realize that there's something deeper than just hearing the noise of the shofar. And then you have to realize that that is the information that is being conveyed in the Torah. And after that, you can step back into that space as an adult and realize that you, we have the actual physical manifestation. And if you are a Jewish person, we indeed do blow a shofar. And the sound of the shofar is actually rooted in spirituality. And that, that spiritual sound that that horn is making is on a frequency that is expressing this information and so I, I hope I'm not getting too complicated but it is so the, the answer is the what I'm trying to say here is that the Messiah is both a person and the information that the person is going to um, going to convey that's why we say build a Beit HaMikdash in your heart 
So the, built on, the Beit HaMikdash is outside of you. It's a building. And we're going to go there. The Jewish people and all the nations of the world are going to send representatives to the world, that, to, the, to the Beit HaMikdash in Jerusalem, where the temple in Jerusalem, where God is most readily and fully manifest in the physical space. But it's also inside of you, that you have your own temple to build inside of yourself by purifying yourself from um, excesses, from physical excesses, and from staying away from bad things and attaching yourself to good things, you are building a temple within yourself. So I hope that's clear and this is something that we have to say to each other over and over again until we have uh, full clarity on this issue. I hope that's, anybody, anybody have a question or a comment about what was said, was it clear? Yeah. Okay, amazing, moving on. When God's oneness becomes revealed, God's goodness becomes revealed in every circumstance of reality. When God's oneness becomes revealed, God's goodness becomes revealed in every circumstance of reality. So you have religious people all over the world, and they said, I got fired from my job and I had no money, and then that led to me being uh, picked to be the vice president of, the, of, of, of some big company, and now I'm super rich and I have a great life. So we have, people have religious experiences all the time, and they say something bad happened to them, they didn't understand why the bad thing happened to them, and then they prayed, we reached out to God and they prayed, and God answered their prayers, and then all of a sudden now they say, they look back and say, best thing that ever happened to me, best thing that ever happened to me, he got fired. So here we say, when God's oneness becomes revealed, God's goodness becomes revealed in every circumstance of reality. So as you become more spiritually, uh, as you acquire spirituality, as you attain your spiritual states, you will know more and more and more and more exactly why everything happened to you and happened to everybody else. When Mashiach comes, when finally, when this whole entire creative process is finished, and we have um, Mashiach comes, Messiah comes, and then we have years of continued learning and building, and then when we finally have resurrection of the dead, where all the 6,000 years of creation of the, of the, of the souls, the 6,000 years of the creations of the souls, we will understand how each generation did this and that and how everything is attached to everything else. We'll be able to turn the, the embroidery over and look at the back and see why, how all the strings go everywhere and we will be amazed and then as we have that revelation, we will realize that everything was for the good. So as things become more unified and balanced and loving in the world, all of the things that happen to us that we perceive as bad will become revealed to us and then we will have, and if you are working harder than the person behind you, you will turn around and you'll be able to be a guide for the person behind you. You'll say, don't worry, it's very dark, but we're gonna make one more turn here and there's gonna be a fantastic lake and we're gonna all go swimming. Oh, don't worry, I know you're almost out of energy, but uh, you, know, we're gonna, you just have to hold on for another three steps and it's gonna be a plateau. So you're, as you develop, you're gonna become more and more, um, not only are you gonna become better at helping other people, but your desire to find somebody to help is gonna grow. So you're gonna not only, instead of thinking about, oh, I would love to be, make another million dollars, you're gonna think, who can I help today? And you're gonna have a deep desire to bring the person up behind you, and that is the tree of life, that we are all connected to each other, and the more we become altruistic, the more we look for other people to help in a true sense, that we're not trying to help them because we know better than them, and because we, because we, right, we get a, a true joy of just seeing someone else connect to the system and make everything more clear and more beautiful. Okay. It becomes revealed that all the obstacles are not obstacles, but rather the opposite. They are the vessels for the supernal light. It becomes revealed that all the obstacles are not obstacles, but rather the opposite. They are the vessels for the supernal light. Okay? We all know this in the modern world. This is something that maybe if you told somebody before, they wouldn't get it, but no pain, no gain. And so if you want to have a desire for a big meal, you don't, you're not gonna have the desire unless you have the lacking. So the lacking can be seen as, so what's the difference between pain and suffering? Pain is pointless. When something's painful and it's pointless, it has no meaning, it has no purpose. You think it's just, I'm just having a horrible time and it doesn't lead anywhere, that's pain. But suffering, I'm sorry, I had it backwards. Did I have it backwards? Yes, so suffering is when we don't know why it's happening to us. Okay, so it's the opposite. When you have somebody's um, just hitting you and there's no purpose for it, there's, uh, it's just suffering. But if you realize that you had a drill sergeant in the army and he kept smacking you every time you picked your head up, 
because he didn't want you to get shot and you really, finally you got hit one too many times and you stopped picking your head up when you were in the foxhole, you'd be very happy. you say, thank God that, that my sergeant kept smacking me in the head and he saved my life. And so um, I think that's clear. Okay, next one. How are we doing on time? Does anybody know? 12.30. 12 12 okay, so we'll go for another 10 minutes because I think we start a little bit late. Okay, the remedy for selfishness is the divine light that is in the Torah. The remedy for selfishness is the divine light that is in the Torah. So we have people who learn, we talked about this, lo lishma to lishma. Um, Lo lishma is not for the right reason, and lishma is for the right reason. It literally means not for her sake, which is the shechina, which is uh, we don't have to go into. It's a name of God, and the um, I'm losing my train of thought. The remedy for selfishness is the divine light that is in the Torah. Okay, so we said from lo lishma to lishma, and so when we do something, when we do Torah mitzvahs for the right reason, which is for us to enter into into altruism, then it works. So one of the missing ingredients is that people are studying Torah mitzvahs and they are already on a very high level. There's people who don't study anything and there's people who are completely uninterested in all this and they just want to, you know, buy a big house somewhere and be famous. But here um, we have people who are learning, but they have, their intention is that they should get a reward in the next world, okay? That is problematic, and so if we learn for the right reason, we say, if I learn Torah, if I read Gemara, and I read Mishnayis, and I learn Tehillim, and I read, read the Torah portion, what I want out of it is that I want to become less selfish, and I want to enter into altruism, I become a better person, then the medicine goes in much better, and it works much better. Does it work? Lolishma? Yes. The Torah does work. It works. Ultimately, it's going to work, but it's nice to do it with the right intention so that it can go nicely and pleasantly, and you can actually see your Olam HaMaba, your world to come, in this world. Meaning that if you study Lolishma, you can access all of these spiritual levels in your lifetime, the Baal says. He says you don't have to just rely on some righteous person, and you don't have to wait for your, uh, for Olam HaBa, for the next world, you don't have to wait for Mashiach to come. If you study the Torah this way, you will end up, something, something's beeping. Oh, it's my, okay. Um, if you study Torah this way, you can attain all of these levels in your lifetime. Lubavitcher Rebbe says that the book of the Chabad Hasidim is the book of the Benoni, of the intermediate person. And the Rebbe said that in this generation, we have a ability, we have the potential to become Sadiqim, to become righteous, to actually attain this thing and not only to rely on other people, not only push away the bad, but to actually reveal the light and to actually enter into spirituality ourselves. Every detail that exists in the world was created to help us come to union with God. Every detail that exists in the world was created to help us come to union with God. Okay, this is the same theme being said again, that every single thing that happens, even if we don't understand it, is actually happening to make this process go forward. So our only real job is to come into alignment with everything that's happening and to, you know, when you have a, a, a wave crashing, it's much better to be ahead of the wave than to be right where the wave is crashing on you. So uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe's uh, wife, Rebbe Zemushka, famously said, we know it's going to be good. Our job is to make it good until it's good, meaning that ultimately we're going to get to the good place. So imagine you go on a hike and you have a whole bunch of people and the entire time someone's complaining and they're saying, this is terrible, we should go back. This leader doesn't know what he's talking about. I don't care that he has... Uh, a badge on his thing, he's, a, he's, he's, he's leading us in the wrong place and bears are going to eat us and tigers are going to eat us and we're going to drown in, the, in this river and this is terrible and I hate everybody here and I'm starting to badmouth everybody say you're going too fast, you're going too slow, right? So that's not fun but they end, actually what happens, they end up getting to the picnic area at the top because the guy does know what he's doing and the person was just complaining and we have other people who understand that this, that the there's bears, but we're not going to run into the bears, and the water's deep, but we know how to get across it. And so the point is, is that if you learn Torah and mitzvahs, you have a guidebook. And if you have a rabbi who actually knows what he's talking about, you have a guide who's been through what he's telling you to do and leading you. And so when we have that, it makes it much more beautiful along the way. That's really our job is to make, God is going to get his way ultimately, and the world is going to be a beautiful place. But our participation in that 
is to make it pretty along the way, and so not to make it rougher for ourselves than it has to be, okay? Reality is one, and God is enclosed in all of it. Reality is one, and God is enclosed in all of it. Okay, simple. I'm not going to even say a word because that is a self-explanatory sentence. When we realize that our impure thoughts are from God, then since God is pure, we become purified. When we realize that our impure thoughts are from God, then since God is pure, we become purified. This is an amazing statement, and it's very uh, something that we can... I think we all know it, but let's try to see if we can tease it apart and explain it a little bit, okay? So, everything is God. So for many generations, people said, I'm getting some messages from God, and I'm getting some messages, messages from the devil. Mm -hmm. And the Jewish people said, Avram Avinu, Yitzchak and Yaakov, and our cousins, uh, holy Muslim people, said the same thing. They know that this is, there's one God. Everything is coming from one source. Not only is everything coming from one source, ain't old Nevado, there's nothing else but God. God is the only driver of this, uh, of this matrix, of this computer program that we're living in. Not only that, but everything is happening for the good. So the, the, our Muslim cousins are mentioned in the Torah and they have a, a blessing and they also did the work and they are doing the work of bringing it should be with peace and gentleness. They brought, they're bringing this, this knowledge that God is one. There is no actor outside of God. There's no devil. There's no, God has angels who do his work. And what an angel is, we can discuss uh, according to science, but uh, it's a force. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a law of nature, but let's not go there right now. The point is, is that God is not only in full control, but everything is happening for the good. So when a person realizes, they say, well, where is this bad thought coming from? This bad thought is coming from God as a test to you. Do you want to, which, um, and many religions and many, uh, you know, many uh, thought systems, even secular thinkers will tell you that, you know, if you choose to engage the bad voices in your head, that's not a very good place to be. And so, you know, don't, if you say, I'm not getting out of bed, you have the op, you have, you can become a creator and you can decide to push away that thought. So the Balatanya comes and says, our job as a Benoni in our intermediate stage is to push away bad thoughts and embrace good thoughts. Say it says in the Torah, um, uh, move, from, move away from evil and move towards good. That is the job that we all are level, we, in our level is our constant daily work is to, God is sending us messages that he wants us to transcend and messages that we want to embrace. And so that's what we just said here. When we realize that our impure thoughts are from God, then since God is pure, we become purified. So if you say, God, I don't want to think this bad thought about this person, and not only I would never speak it, and I certainly wouldn't take an action against this person, but I am thinking, gee, I don't like this person, I don't like the way they look, I don't want to hang out with them, I don't like the way they smell. This is the opportunity for you to understand that to think this, to read this uh, sentence to yourself and understand that God is sending you this for you not to do it, not to think it. And so we have in Torah Judaism, we have a bunch of mitzvot, a bunch of uh, obligations um, that we do, that we do something, and then we have a whole bunch that we don't do. And so we don't eat non-kosher, we, uh, we don't light a candle on the Sabbath, and we don't speak bad about other people. And so here is our opportunity to do both of them at the same time. We have a good thought, we should not only think it, but we should say it, and not only should we say it, but we should actually do something about it. And if we have a bad thought, we should push it away and realize that God is sending it to us and that that's our opportunity to build a vessel for our good thoughts. We'll make more room, right? So if we push out the bad thoughts, we're making room for the good thoughts. If we hang out with people who think positively and speak positively and act positively, then that is our opportunity to emulate them, okay? That was our last, um, we ran out of time, so thank you very much, everybody, and I hope that these things made sense. Please reach out with questions, comments. We've been getting a lot of comments online about how much people are enjoying the classes, and we've also been getting some uh, comments about how to make improvements. Somebody asked us if we could please um, make sure to speak, if we speak any Hebrew words, that we should make sure to translate them and we're gonna make more of an effort to do that, so we really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, and looking forward to seeing you next week. Thank you so much. Thank you.